Okay, well, it's 3.01 by my clock. So um, in the interest of time, we might begin. Uh, my name is Dr. Lisa Higgins. I am a clinical trialist and health economist based at Monash University in Melbourne. And today we have Associate Professor Brett Manley and Dr. Claire Whitehead presenting the platypus trial for us. Uh, but before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet today, which for me is the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and to also extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here with us today. So our two panellists today, Brett and Claire, I might get you to just very briefly introduce yourselves before we introduce our panellists. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, I'm a consultant neonatologist here at the Women's Hospital in Melbourne, where we're sitting now, and uh, I also work in the Department of Obstetrics, Gynaecology and Newborn Health uh, at the University of Melbourne, and um, I'm interested in, in looking after sick and preterm babies as part of my job and, uh, and undertaking clinical trials to improve outcomes for those babies. Claire. Thanks, Brett. Uh, my name is Claire Whitehead. So I'm an obstetrician and subspecialist maternal fetal and maternal fetal medicine. So look after complex high risk pregnancies. I'm also based at the Women's in Melbourne um, and uh, I'm a researcher within the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of Melbourne. So together we co-lead Platypus. My research is around what we do in pregnancy uh, to try and improve outcomes for mothers uh, and their babies after birth. Thanks, Brett and Claire. So we have four panellists today. Um, I have introduced myself, but I may get the other panellists to briefly introduce themselves. Uh, Tom? Uh, thanks, Lisa. I'm a um, paediatrician and a clinical trialist uh, in the School of Public Health at University of Sydney. Mitch? Uh, I'm a um, <clears throat> consumer advocate and consumer advisor to uh, Tom's team and work as a community involvement coordinator at Child Kids Institute. And Cam? Great, and I work as the, the project manager for a trial called RemapCat, which is an adaptive platform trial, and I'm based at Monash University in Melbourne. Uh -huh. So thank you very much to our panellists for their time today. Uh, and just to say that this actor work is supported by um, an MRFF grant, uh, for which we are very grateful. Just a little bit of housekeeping. Can everyone please make sure they are on mute? Um, if during the during Brett and Claire's presentation you have any questions, please do put them in the chat and we will go through them after the presentation. Uh, and we'll also, Claire and Brett will be presenting some questions to the panel at the end of their presentation. And this session will be recorded um, and be made available on the ACTA website. So uh, for those who don't want, um, please keep your video and audio off um, unless you are speaking uh, after the presentation. Uh, so I will stop sharing and hand over to Brett and Claire to begin their presentation. Well, thanks so much, Lisa and Acta, for the invitation to be here. And it's great to see the panelists and all the people in the audience, and many of whom uh, of whose names we recognise very well as being experts in clinical trials and particularly in adaptive platform trials. So we're like we're loving being here, learning from you all as we try and navigate this this brave new world. Um, we're here today to present uh, the Platypus trial. This is a, a world first perinatal adaptive platform trial that we co-lead as a as a neonatologist and an obstetrician together. And the aim of this platform and the trials within it are to improve outcomes for babies born premature. So here's a little extremely preterm baby who's about three seconds old. These are the sorts of babies that we're seeing more and more of in our uh, tertiary centres and neonatal intensive care units around Australia and around the world. And whilst this little guy is about a 25-week preterm baby, we're now looking after babies born as early as 23 and 22 weeks gestation, more and more frequently. And uh, as you might expect, the evidence for things that we do is, is getting weaker and weaker as we look after smaller and sicker babies. Preterm births are a huge problem for uh, the community. So about 10% of all births around the world are preterm before 37 weeks gestation. And if you look at it in broad numbers around the world, about 15 million are born per year and about 1 million die. So that's the greatest cause of death uh, for children under five years old in the world. In Australia, the, the problem is still a big one. About 8% of all births are preterm. And that adds up to about 25,000 preterm babies born each year in Australia. 
when we think about the smallest and sickest preterm infants, they're extremely preterm babies born before 28 weeks gestation or more than three months early. There's about almost 800,000 of these born each year around the world, about 1,200 in Australia and New Zealand combined. So um, a relatively small number but a big burden on the health system and families. And, and uh, obviously these babies have a lot of challenges through the first months of their life if they survive. And mortality is quite high. Um, if you're thinking of this as any other disease with a mortality of 15 or 20%, you'd think that was pretty high. And the smaller you are and the more immature you are, the higher the mortality. But perhaps just as important, although we're getting very good at these babies surviving with our neonatal intensive care and antenatal treatments, about one-fifth will have a major neurodevelopmental disability at the age of two, and about half develop bronchopulmonary dysplasia, or what we call the chronic lung disease of prematurity that carries a huge burden through childhood. So preterm babies have problems with their breathing. They're often born with this respiratory distress syndrome of prematurity. They need respiratory support like CPAP, or they need to be intubated if they're smaller and sicker. We've got this miracle treatment since the early 1990s called surfactant, which has gone a long way to improving mortality and morbidity from respiratory distress syndrome. But still, a lot of preterm babies, especially the most immature, need a lot of help right from the moment they're born. And that's because they've also got uh, other issues with their cardiovascular system that make them more prone to morbidity. Preterm babies can go on and have complications like chronic lung disease, retinopathy of prematurity and the risk of blindness abdominal or gastrointestinal diseases like necrotizing enterocolitis or bleeding in the brain called intraventricular hemorrhage. And all of these adverse outcomes are known to be associated with worse outcomes in the long term. Having just spoken about the sorts of problems that the tiniest babies have, it's important to point out that moderate or late preterm babies are much more common than extremely preterm babies, as I said on some of the earlier slides, and in fact represent the bulk, the bulk of morbidity at a societal level. So these are babies that are more like 32, 33, 34, right up to 36 weeks gestation, who still require admission to the neonatal unit, are still separated from their mother and family, and can still have breathing problems, infection, hypoglycemia, jaundice or feeding issues that require a stay in the neonatal unit, which can be days or weeks. I'm going to pass over to Claire. So what do we do to try and improve the outcomes for these babies currently? So there's a huge number of clinical trials going on, both in mothers during pregnancy um, and in the neonatal uh, units to try and understand how we can do things better. And when we look just at data from clinicaltrials.gov, you know, we've got four, 460 um, trials that are ongoing. We're currently recruiting in Australia and New Zealand. Apparently, we've got nearly 120. But we know that 50% of these trials will never be completed. 30% um, of those will actually never make it to publication. There's increasing concerns that the data that is being published may in fact be false. And um, we've had a, a number of examples in obstetrics and neonatal research of that. Um, but a lot of the time these trials are inconclusive, they're underpowered, they need to be repeated and questions remain unanswered. Um, and this all costs money. And so one example of this is antenatal corticosteroids. So Brett mentioned surfactant, but we give the mother corticosteroids when she's pregnant, expecting a preterm baby to try and improve the lung development of those babies. And we first did this about 50 years ago, but we've still got so many unanswered questions about what we should be doing. We still don't really know who to give it to and when, what gestational age um, babies benefit from it. And this has been made worse by the fact that data that we thought we could believe has recently been retracted. Um, there are trials ongoing in Australia and New Zealand to answer this. We don't know which is the best steroid drug to give. And again, there's trials going on internationally and within Australia to try and answer which drug, which dose, um, at which gestation. And then we don't know what to do for particular populations. So mothers with certain medical conditions, such as diabetes, where the risk is even higher of causing problems by giving steroids. Um, and again, we've got another trial recruiting in Australia at the moment. So as you can see, if we just think about steroids, We've got four trials running trying to answer simple questions that all could potentially be uh, combined into an adaptive platform trial rather than being run individually. It's not just in mothers that we don't really know what to do with steroids. So the same, there's many unanswered questions about what to do with steroid use in babies. So it's used to try and prevent um, the chronic lung disease that Brett spoke about. And again, trials have been running for many, many years in this area with large numbers of babies um, included looking at different types of drugs um, and different ways of administering them. And again, we still don't really have the answer about who, when, which drug 
um, what to do and how long we should be giving, giving them for. So another um, example of what an adaptive platform trial might be better used for, we do have individual trials trying to answer some of these questions. And our current use of evidence is actually pretty poor in terms of what we do in obstetrics and gynecology and, and neonatal medicine as well. So this is a, just an example from a paper that was published recently looking at the guidelines that were produced by the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine. So this is a big organization in the US that provides guidelines for care of pregnancy and complex pregnancy. And only 8% of the recommendations were actually based on data that had been supported by RCTs, the large but being consensus or limited evidence driving it. Um, and it's not just in America, we see this if we look internationally and we look at the WHO guidelines for what to do for preterm infants. Again, the, the evidence and the uh, quality of the evidence that drives those, uh, those guidelines is still pretty low and there's many, many unanswered questions. So what don't we know how to do? Well, this is just an example of some of the things we're still unsure about in mothers and, and neonatal uh, babies. We don't know about how, when to use antenatal steroids how to best to support the transition from being in the womb to being um, to being born and needing to go to the nursery, how best to support breathing in the first few days of life, how we can avoid the mechanical ventilator because we know that that does harm to the lungs, how to avoid infection and sepsis and brain injury, how to treat or avoid in the first place that chronic lung disease we mentioned, how to manage problems with the cardiovascular system and blood pressure, fluids, and how best to feed babies. Um, and these all have all been recognized as priorities for parents as well as uh, for us um, as questions that we need to answer moving forward. What does this look like in terms of the journey for the baby? Yeah, I think another way of picturing all of these unanswered questions is just what an extremely preterm infant goes through um, during their, their time before birth and then in the neonatal period. So here's the antenatal and postnatal period. And there's lots of opportunities here to think about where we can improve the evidence for our practices. So you might have a mother at high risk of extreme preterm birth that comes into a, a tertiary hospital like ours at the women's. And as Claire mentioned, we've got opportunities here to think about how we best use antenatal steroids or other examples such as how we give antibiotics if she's ruptured her membranes early. Then at the time of delivery, what's the best way to actually deliver the preterm infant? We've got maternal outcomes to think about with the antenatal interventions to make sure they're safe for mum. What about delayed cord clamping? Should we be providing respiratory support on the cord to extremely preterm babies? How do we best resuscitate or stabilise with oxygen, with pressures, with the use of caffeine to get babies breathing? What are some of the issues with early management, like the mode of ventilation, when and how to give surfactant, treating something we call the PDA in the heart, how we give more caffeine to keep babies breathing, how we best feed them or give antibiotics, right through to prophylaxis against chronic lung disease in babies that are quite sick and using postnatal steroids to try and improve their lung disease. And you can imagine over this sort of continuum, the multiple opportunities as a baby moves through um, this time course to, to randomise treatments or to compare treatments to work out which is best. And for us, it's not only about how a baby is in the neonatal period or whether they survive to go home. We have to think about our patients quite differently from some other specialties because it's all about how they grow up. Can they grow up? How much help do they need with day-to-day -day activities? Can they contribute to society and do they have a good quality of life? So longer term outcomes are essential for anything we do in the perinatal period. So now we're going to talk about the platypus trial itself. So all these questions have prompted us to design the trial to try and answer at least some of them. Um, and so our trial is called the Platform for Adaptive Trials in Perinatal Units or Platypus. Um, we're funded by MRFF for the development of the trial um, and we're supported by the clinical trial network for our perinatal group of PESANS, which is called the Impact Network in Australia and, and New Zealand um, and supported by MCRI as our clinical trial centre. Um, so the goal of our trial is to improve outcomes for babies that are born or from preterm birth. I think this is clearly a very important public health problem, as we've outlined. We want to be better at being able to enrol every patient uh, that's eligible. We want every hospital that's caring for these preterm babies, so that's about 30 in Australia and New Zealand, to be part of the trial. We want every clinician in those hospitals to be empowered to support and participate. Um, and to do this, we're hoping to design a streamlined and efficient setup process simple recruitment and consent processes, routinely collected data, um, and although short-term data will be what we adapt on, it'll be the long-term outcomes that we recognise are important. 
So our design is it's an investigator initiated adaptive platform trial assessing multiple interventions that we do both during pregnancy and in the neonatal unit. So we have two populations that potentially can be enrolled. There's a pregnant woman um, who may be carrying one or more fetuses who is at risk of preterm birth and then the infant itself if it's been born preterm. We're focusing on hospitals that provide both maternity care um, and neonatal care, but we recognize that some of our uh, units only provide one of them and they'll also be able uh, to be uh, one of the sites involved. And our primary outcome we'll talk more about, but is short-term neonatal morbidity and mortality that are surrogates for longer-term health and development. Uh, with anything that we do to the mother, we'll also be recording maternal safety uh, information. This is kind of the schema for the platform eligibility. So that's the pregnant women, um, simple el eligibility criteria, which got you're pregnant, you're at risk of preterm birth and you're in an appropriate uh, hospital or you're an infant that's been born preterm and you're in an appropriate hospital. And the plan that would be that you could be randomized at two points. So the mother and the baby, um, and you can randomize to multiple domains, um, which we will talk through moving on. In terms of our primary outcome, so we've chosen a primary ordinal outcome, um, which has created challenges for us that we'd like to talk through with those of you that are using ordinal outcomes. Um, but that's been on the basis of advice that we've been given, and we, we do have uh, faith that this is the right decision to take. So we've got an, an outcome which has got uh, 15 points in it, and the points that we've put into it are based on things that consumers, clinicians, and researchers, and other stakeholders have already told us are important. So there's already core outcome sets for neonatal uh, trials in neonatal medicine and core outcome sets for what we should do for pregnancy and childbirth conditions. And so we've really focused on what parents and families have told us and them, as well as other um, organizations such as the ICOM uh, group that have done similar studies to give us a, a good list. So we, we use that as the basis for this. Um, we've done a bit of work with checking with consumers, checking with clinicians and other stakeholders that what we put in is the right thing. And we're doing some validation work around what this actually looks like in practice and how it would, um, uh, what our trial, our previous trials would, would have said if we used an ordinal outcome rather than a sort of traditional um, dichotomous outcome or composite outcome. So this is what we've come up with as our ordinal outcome. We're gonna measure it at 42 weeks post-menstrual age or if you discharge from hospital earlier. So for those of you that, don't know about pregnancy, 40 weeks is your due date. So 42 weeks is about as late as you would go if you were pregnant and before the doctor said, time's up, you need this baby to get out. Um, so this is sort of capturing quite a short term outcome, but recognizing that those babies that are born at 22 weeks, they'll be 20 weeks old at the time that we're measuring this. And those babies that are 36 weeks will obviously only be born at 36 weeks, will only be six weeks old at the point of measurement. But we believe that it will capture um, the important things that can happen to a baby during that nursery. So with the worst thing being death, um, second worst things being a composite of severe morbidity um, that we know is ranked in that order because of that's what correlates with worse long-term outcomes. Um, and then the spectrum of things that can happen to the severely preterm babies, the extreme preterm babies, right up to those that we see just in the later babies where an admission to the neonatal unit may be the only thing that happens to them. Um, we're also collecting information about the mother and other secondary outcomes. So all of those outcomes will be collected individually. Um, and then we'll be collecting and say stuff about the mother, other outcomes about the baby, and then looking at long term data in terms of growth and development, quality of life um, and health economics and other things later on. Um, so in terms of what we're going to be looking at from a research question, we're starting with two domains. So one in pregnancy and, and one in the newborn. The first one we're going to look at in pregnancy is in mothers that have broken their waters prematurely. So we call this PPROM. So this affects only 3% of all pregnancies, but nearly 50% of babies, of mothers that go into preterm labor will break their waters prior to this. So from a preterm baby point of view, it's, it's an important um, group. It's associated with morbidity for the mother. So sepsis, hemorrhage, need for emergent cesarean section. Um, and the associations with that is associated with morbidity for the baby um, and then morbidity and mortality, which is worse for babies that have an infection um, in the setting of, of PPROM than it is for babies that are just born preterm. There's a lot of things we do to mothers with PPROM. Um, we give them antibiotics, we give them steroids, we try and stop them from going into labor. We give them magnesium sulfate, which protects the baby's brains. Uh, there's work about whether we should be given probiotics 
So these are things that are currently being done, and we have data to support some of them, but not a great amount of data to support what we do from an antibiotic point of view. So all women that break their waters prior to term will be given antibiotics. Um, and the data that we're using to support this is about 20 years old. So there's two big trials, one from 1997, 600 patients, um, and one from 2002 in the UK um, that recommended two different re regimens of antibiotics. And that's largely what's used internationally, one or, one or either of them. There's a whole splattering of other antibiotics that are used in different countries and by, for different reasons. Um, but there's been no head-to-head -head comparison of the two antibiotic regimes um, in a clinical trial setting. So our plan is to try and determine uh, what is the best antibiotic regime for the, to improve outcomes for babies that are born after PPROM. We'll be recruiting pregnant women um, who are at a viable gestation um, up until the end of that preterm period uh, who were planning active neonatal management. So some of the 22 weekers will not be planning on having active care of their baby. We won't recruit them until a little bit later. Um, and our intervention is a combination is four different antibiotic regimes that are currently in use um, throughout Australia and New Zealand, and sort of a 50-50 representation of those people that are using amoxicillin and a macrolide versus those that are just using um, a macrolide alone. Uh, but which macrolide we're not sure. And our ordinal outcome will be our primary outcome, but we'll also be measuring maternal outcomes as well. And Brett will talk to you about the neonatal domain. Thanks, Bray. You've heard me mention caffeine a couple of times already. And uh, in fact, caffeine is one of the, the uh, most used drugs in all of neonatology and, and one of those with very good evidence behind it. And it's to um, prevent this condition or help treat this condition of apnea of prematurity. It's very common for very preterm infants to have pauses in their breathing. And when they have pauses in their breathing, they often drop their oxygen saturations or, and their, or their heart rate. Sometimes that leads to them needing to have respiratory support or even be intubated. And we know that there's a cumulative effect of these events on longer term outcomes. The caffeine for apnea of prematurity trial is one of the most famous trials ever done in neonates. This was a, about a 15-year-old trial now that enrolled over 2,000 very preterm infants and compared caffeine at the doses on the screen there to a placebo to see whether this actually improved both short and longer term outcomes. And why this is quite a, a revered study is because they were able to not only demonstrate in uh, that caffeine had effect on reducing bronchopulmonary dysplasia, the chronic lung disease of, of prematurity, one of the only uh, therapies to do so, but they followed the children through to early childhood and even later childhood, right up to 11 years old, and were able to demonstrate ongoing positive effects on these children without any adverse effects. That simply giving caffeine in the neonatal period could be uh, was was associated with. Uh, I think this really highlights some of the challenges that we have in perinatal medicine: the need to follow our patients for a long time to determine ongoing efficacy and safety. So the use of caffeine and how we use it is a hot topic because of go, although we've got that great CAT trial, like a lot of things in our profession, a little bit's good, so maybe more is better and people have been using it more. Uh, there's uncertainty uh, at higher doses, uncertainty about when it should be start, stopped, whether you should stop and start it at various times in the stay of a preterm baby. And if we think about just the dose of caffeine, there's been seven uh, small trials of higher caffeine dosing compared to that used in the CAP trial. And it shows some potentially beneficial effects, including that it may reduce BPD further, i.e. a higher dose of caffeine. But there's a lot of concern about higher doses as well. And it's really unclear whether that's a safe or efficacious thing to do. Having said that, hospitals around Australia and New Zealand are already doing it. So we propose a uh, the Baby Chino trial, which will be the first caffeine, uh, which will be the first domain in the neonatal domain in platypus, comparing a higher dose of caffeine to the standard dose used in the CAP trial. One of the things we're just discussing is whether there's only one higher dose or whether, for example, we have a low, medium and high dose in this arm. Uh, again, the primary outcome being the platypus ordinal outcome, but with an eye to things like pharmacology, adverse effects and health economics, of course. So how have we been going to date with our planning for platypus, which is uh, already more than two years in the making? So this is just, I mean, again, to get feedback on whether we're doing the right things or not. Um, so this is our kind of schema for what our protocols look like at this stage. So we've got our core protocol. Um, we have domain specific appendices that are define, defining the protocols for those specific um, domains. And so at the moment we just have the two of them, but there will be more to follow. And then we have a group of core appendices. We've got our statistical appendix. We've got operational appendixes, and there's quite a few of them. 
Um, we'll have region specific appendixes. We're starting just in Australia and New Zealand, but obviously there's some ethical differences and other differences between those two areas. So there's an Australian and a New Zealand one being developed. And then we have some other ones that in due course, we're still in the process of putting together for sub-studies and biospecimens and, and other special populations. Um, but this is the kind of framework that we're using to move forward with that. We've got a leadership structure, which I know is a bit small to read on here, but kind of there's so many groups, um, it's hard to squish them all in. But basically we've got a trial management and steering committee, which is made up of a small group of us with representatives from um, Australia, New Zealand, clinical trial stats, consumers, um, and we're hoping to have some um, Indigenous representation on that as well, although that's yet to be confirmed. And then we have a much larger scientific advisory panel, which includes uh, people from across the sites, um, people with content knowledge um, and clinical trial knowledge and things. So that's that's a much bigger group. We've got a data, data soft safety and monitoring board. And then we have um, groups working underneath that. So we've got a pregnancy domains committee, which is sort of driving the research agenda for interventions that we're doing in pregnancy and likewise in the neonatal group. Um, and they're in charge of the domain specific working groups that will run the individual trials after that. We've got a lived experience committee, um, which will be for both Australia and New Zealand. We're trying to establish our Indigenous Health Committee, committee at the moment. Um, and we've got a stats advisory committee, which at the moment is running as a stats advisory committee, but will split in due course to the analytics team um, as well once we actually start recruiting patients. Um, at the moment, we've got a, a main trial coordinating centre in, in Melbourne, and then we'll have regional centres as well as required um, and participating sites. We're hoping to have up to 30. Why have we picked the domains we have and how are we going to do that? So at the moment we haven't, uh, we're doing some ongoing prioritisation work within Australia and New Zealand, but we've largely used um, work that's already been done to sort of say what are the top 10 priorities for preterm birth research? And that's how we've picked the initial domains and how we'll continue to pick the domains. But we do have some geographical specific representation about why we want to pick, pick particular domains that, that are relevant to the Australia and New Zealand population. Although we're very keen that this will be representative outside our region as well. Um, we've engaged Spiral to run our data management. Um, I think it's probably one of the more complicated ones that they'll be doing, given that we're recruiting two different individuals, the mother and the baby, at different time points with multiple different domains, might be running at different time points. Um, but they tell us that they're confident that they'll be able to manage this. So um, we're, we're hopeful that that will be the case as well. Um, we hope at some point we'll have a sort of registry component, but we're not doing that straight off the bat because it's just a bit too much to do at the start. Um, we've got health economics team working with us. So they're doing a fair bit of work in the background around the methodology of health economics and adaptive platform trials. So that's not specific to perinatal medicine, uh, but adaptive platform trials in general and how they may or may not be more cost effective than running individual RCTs. Um, and so they're collaborating with uh, some of you on the call and, and potentially some other international collaborators too, um, and then developing health economic analyses for our program as well. Um, I can't see who exactly is on the call, but I think a few of our statistical team are here. Kate Lee's uh, leading the team. So the plan is to use Bayesian methods. We're still working out what their interval for data analysis will be, but probably will be around about 500 patients each time. We're planning on using a proportional odds ratio as the uh, main way of anal main analysis method. Um, and Kate can obviously fill us in a bit more about that. Um, we're still working through what the stopping and starting rules will be as we've still got ongoing simulations. So we're, we're not there yet in terms of putting that all together. Um, and our thought at the moment is we're going to start with fixed randomization, which is a one to one to one ratio, depending on the, the intervention. Um, but we've had a lot of debate about whether we should be considering response adaptive randomization or not. So keep keen to hear others' thoughts on that. As I said, we're currently funded for the development of the trial. So we've got an MRFF. Uh, that will run to 2025. Um, Brett's got an investigator grant that will help support some of the initial um, caffeine work. And we have a number of grant applications currently under review with various different NHMRC and MRFF schemes, specifically around those first two domains, uh, which we then, once we're up and running, will ex we'll expand to further domains. Um, and this is our sort of team, which represents, uh, as I say, a spectrum of people from across Australia and New Zealand. And we're collaborating with the Australian Preterm Birth Prevention Alliance, which is an existing uh, pregnancy related uh, implementation group and the Australian New Zealand Neonatal Network, um, which records outcome information for all the neonates that are born preterm. So that's where we're up to. We've got some questions, I guess, for you, but um, then you can tell us 
your questions. So this is our challenges um, and what we want to know. Yeah, so we just run through some of these things to get get the discussion going for the last minute or so. Firstly, um, I mentioned this is a world first scenario, and and having two patients or more is is something that's pretty tricky. Uh, adds extra dimensions to all all components of the platform for me, um, and therefore two entry points to the platform: a, a mother or, or a child. Um, multiple time points for different domains. I sort of ran through that timeline of an extremely pre but you can see how many different time points there are where we may want to compare uh, treatments or interventions. Uh, multiple domains with multiple interventions. We've discussed the neonatal primary ordinal outcome, which we have uh, which we have developed especially for this new trial. Um, and because it's new, that means it comes with challenges as well. How we balance the outcomes of, or the primary outcome of the trial against longer term outcomes and against maternal outcomes. For example, what if something improves outcomes for babies but is dangerous for mothers? Um, how we embed the trial uh, with registry data collection and with uh, routinely collected data will be a challenge. We've instigated this trial in Australia and New Zealand to try and keep it controlled and, and what a great place it is to have the trial, no doubt about it, that between us we can answer these questions. But of course, whether we go internationally has been uh, something that's been on our minds. And providing insurance and sponsorship, um, we're very keen to hear how others have done it. Um, you know, this is a fairly daunting, daunting ask of sponsors and insurers, I think, to think about the potential for antenatal and postnatal interventions in a, a very sick population of babies and mothers at risk as well. We've been thinking about where we should register the platform and clinicaltrials.gov seems to be the most likely at the moment, but you know, happy to hear what others have done and whether you've registered different domains in different places or how you've managed that. Ethics submissions, we've got a, a very helpful ethics uh, human research ethics committee here in Australia at the, uh, in Melbourne at the Royal Children's Hospital. And at the moment, we're going to submit our core protocol for approval and then the other, add the other appendices for approval as we go along, adding in the domains. But again, we're keen to hear what others have done. We've got the challenges of site engagement. So that is both really for this to work, we're going to need all of our sites and all of our clinicians and consumers on board. Otherwise, it's going to fall over. So we have to be providing a platform that is useful to people and that they can see the value of. Uh, and also that they're able to continue to conduct their own research in. It's not about trying to take over all research. It's about providing a platform for, for new important research. So it's you, the use of an ordinal outcome, as far as we're aware, has never been done in a large-scale perinatal trial. It's got pros and cons. Which order do you put things in? Which outcomes do you put in? How do you, how do you make them uh, important enough to all of the stakeholders that you can adapt on them? And how do you work in the results of longer term outcomes, which every baby in the trial is going to need? In terms of the analysis, there's the ongoing simulation work, which is complex and takes time. We've been talking about using a proportional odds ratio. We've brought, Claire's brought up the issue of whether we think about response adaptive randomization, which brings its own complexities. And of course, how do we communicate and interpret the findings of this platform? Um, perinatal clinicians and consumers are not used to uh, being part of these sorts of trials. We're not used to hearing the results or the conclusions for these sort of trials. And when you think about what I've put in blue there being uh, a proposed sort of conclusion of a trial like this or of remap cap or of recovery or others, it's just about getting people's heads around what it all actually means and how you interpret it. So there's some of the challenges and questions that we'd like to throw out to the audience. Thanks again, everyone, for listening. Uh, and we'll we'll throw open to the floor now. Thanks, Brent and Claire. That was fantastic. I might get you to flick back to where your questions are, um, if that's possible. Um, and then I might just open either Mitch or Tom or Cam, if any of you want to start with any of them. I know Brent and Claire, sorry, they're on multiple slides. Um, there, there's numerous there. Um, Cam, do you want to start with the um, questions about the sponsor and insurance and those types of things? Um, sure, the easy ones. Um, <laughs> um, I just want to say fantastic uh, project. It's such an interesting area and obviously one that has potential for a lot of impact. And I um, also just want to congratulate you on your, your names. Baby Chino is fantastic. Uh, it's great. Um, actually, I might just quickly comment on the registration um, because I've been actually part of uh, a discussion recently for um, an actor special interest group about this. So um, clinicaltrials.gov have some have a paper that I'll put into the chat that recommends 
having an entry for your sort of master protocol, um, so to speak, and then a separate one for each domain. I have to say that's not the approach that we took for remap cap. Um, the reasons that they recommend that are in the paper, but the reasons that we went down that path are partially because we'd already uh, created a single entry for multiple domains, but also um, just the, the burden of workload of keeping everything updated and, and aligned was, was a bit too much uh, for us. But I'll, I'll put that into the chat. So hopefully that helps a little bit. And did clinical trials push back on that that sort of um, approach, Cam? Well, we've had a look at your trial registration exact at, for that very reason to see how you've done it, but they've obviously let it let it through. Yes, yeah, yeah, they did. Um, so I contacted them directly to ask about it, and they did um, say that they recommended the other approach, but we haven't had any um, any sort of pushback yet. Um, uh, look, I'm not sure about insurance. Um, yes, it does seem like it's a um, it's a fairly uh, difficult population for. Um, but I mean, we we do trials in you know critically ill patients all the time with you know more or less risky interventions. So I think um, you know talking to your institution and you know through your universities often have clinical and trial insurance that will cover. Um, a range of things, um, but I'm not sure how much more I can say about that. Um, in terms of sponsorship, um, look, I think the only thing I can recommend is, is um, I think having one core team, even if you're across uh, multiple uh, regions, is useful um, to, to sort of have clear delegation of responsibilities. Um, again, not the approach that we've necessarily taken with Remap, but I, I think that would help a lot. Um, and yeah, I might I might just see if anyone else has any other comments on those things. I might just throw to Andrew, who's got his hand up. I assume it's in relation to this component of what we're talking about, Andrew. Yes, yeah, just that the as Brett probably knows already, the and Claire, the, the insurance only becomes a major problem when you move internationally, and that it will it. <laughs> You can probably get it, but it'll just be very expensive. And you'll need to think about how you engage regional sponsors to try and mitigate the cost. Um, yes, yeah, Andrew, I think that's one of the one of the reasons that we're trying to this is not starting small by any by any measure, but one of the reasons that we're not sort of trying to go worldwide to start with, just get things better down in Australia and, and New Zealand. Um, and 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 those two countries have a long history of working together on clinical trials. So we're hoping that that, that does um that does reduce some of those difficulties. Yeah. yeah, but I think that insurance even within Australia and New Zealand is something, certainly with pregnancy trials where we've had to have, have had to have sponsors and separate insurance for different countries. So we can talk more about that, Andrew. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Thanks. Brett, I just wanted to talk about, you, you, you know, you initially spoke about fixed randomization and not doing response adaptive randomization. And I think the first thing when I looked at your baby Chino domain was thinking, why do you only have two interventions? You know, to only look at the standard and then one higher is only going to, I, I sort of, I suppose I wondered about why you wouldn't put in multiple doses and have response adaptive randomization and you'll pretty quickly drop out, hopefully, you know, the doses that aren't you know, and, and, you know, with response adaptive randomization with more than two interventions, you're going to increase your power by using RAR. Um, and, and to me, to do it, to do a domain where you have the opportunity to try and find the right dose, as opposed to just comparing two doses, I, I think I would definitely be looking at adding doses and using response adaptive randomization to, to get to the correct dose rather than having a domain trigger and going, okay, well, this dose is better than this dose, but we still probably haven't answered the question about what the right dose is. We've just answered that one dose is better than the other. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. And that's certainly how we've planned our grants and until about one day ago, how we planned the protocol as well. This is still a discussion point. One of the issues is that there isn't actually a wide enough range of doses that we feel are potentially safe to be able to have five or six different doses, for example. I think it's feasible to have a, a low, medium and high dose, which is what we put into our grants and what we still may do. Um, some of the issues that creates are with overlap between the groups. So there's the ability for clinicians to go up or down a bit, and that means that there's a bit of uh, overlap between groups, which will, you know, which which isn't isn't ideal. Um, so it's certainly thinking about it in terms of the response adaptive randomization part of it. We had talked about that being a part of the trial, but um, our statisticians have been sort of moving away from it a little bit. 
uh, we, we, we mainly because of the complexities that involves with analysis and uh, interim analyses. But Kate Lee's there. I don't know if Rob Mars on the call or anyone else from, from the Platypus Stats team would like to comment on the pros and cons of response adaptive randomization in this trial. Are you on, uh, Kate, I can't see my whole screen, but are you online, Kate? Do you want to speak? Yeah, to so I am here. Um, I think Rob's probably in a better position to answer than I am. Rob, do you want to jump in? If not, I'll say something. Um, yeah, I think the main reasons that we've moved away from response adaptive randomization is apart from, as Brett mentioned, the complexities. This is already a complex trial. Um, we need to sort of uh keep it keep it feasible for the for the analyst um but also just there's there's uh reasons there's some really good reasons not to do response adaptive randomization uh yes. and in this one especially um one of the main sort of one of the main um challenges if we did implement response adaptive randomization would be any subsequent analysis where we're trying to um, do a sensitivity analysis on um, on concurrently randomized cohorts. So this, there's this big uh, issue in adaptive trials that if you're if you're doing multiple adapt adaptations um, that there can be uh, and background risk levels are changing then you can have have confounding and can, it can lead you to sort of biased inference. So um, that's one of the main reasons why we're sort of moving away from it. But apart from anything, there just doesn't seem to be enough benefit to having these really kidly, you know, fine grained response adaptive randomization when we can have um, just a, a more blunt stopping rule. So we can have the four different, you know, doses in there and have response adaptive randomization basically being done as in terms of a in terms of stopping group sequential stopping rules. So uh, those are the main sort of reasons off the top of my head. Um, I, I suppose for me, one of the things I think about RAR is that it's actually a selling point when you're getting consent. That, 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 that you know, like I, I'd be really interested in Mitch's thoughts on this because being able to say to someone, they are like they are more likely to be randomized to the intervention that is likely to result in a better outcome is actually from a consent point of view um i think it makes the trial quite appealing to the public and to people is you know and, and i obviously work in icu and um you know in very very stressful situations i think a trial going where where you know you're explaining that we don't know the answer but the likely you know you've got a higher likelihood of being randomized to the intervention that's currently looking like it's performing the best but Mitch do you maybe want to comment yeah I mean I think that's that's possibly right I think the really key part about it though is explaining all of that in a way that's really clear I know that we've had some issues with um in BCF we had uh people when we talked about randomization we've got um in our antibiotic um we've got uh, either two antibiotics or there's an arm with one and I think one of the things we found out is we've got to be really, you've got to be really clear about why you're doing it. So that explanation of we're not sure what's best is really got to be got to be up front and um, before you go on to the next bit, because that's that's really what people are listening for. And um, and making sure that you know you, you're talking about what are the outcomes that are you've got those James Lind ones, I think they're the James Lind ones you've used, and making sure that. We're actually making, explaining how you're trying to get to those outcomes, which have been um, validated by by communities. So I think being really clear up front about what it is, and I think a response adaptive randomization is is a really good selling point, as you said, Lisa, because it is one of those things where you can instead of I think that whole regular thing is you know there may be nothing you won't find anything about. This is actually giving a potential benefit to people that they wouldn't get otherwise when you've got so so that would be another benefit along the way to explain 
I think they, you have to be cautious about, I mean, it is a nice, I keep thinking, you know, it is a really nice fluffy selling point that we can have this trial that learns <laughs> all these things, but we need to make sure that it doesn't mess with the statistical machinery. That's the main thing. Um, like there's a, there's enough selling points for a trial like this without having to give a, a like this other, what's what would be fairly esoteric sort of, um, you know, uh, characteristic to to a, a present that to a participant to be able to sell it. Um, it's with the with stopping, you are doing response adaptive randomization. It's just you're doing it at a like in, in fins rather than continuously. So I think you can still make that that same sales pitch for lack of a better word. Have you, you know, temporary yeah. in in your uh, involvement with consumers in in your planning to date? Have you talked about those sorts of things that that issue because there's there's differences there. You don't want to mess with the statistics, but equally you want to make sure that you're doing something that um, fits in with what the community expectation of this would be as well. So have you had that sort of conversation with people? You've the short answer is about responsive adaptation specifically no but right. i think i think as rob sort of pointed out we've got to work out what's going to work first and if we have options then i think absolutely we go to, to our to our lived experience team and say you know is this something you you want to push for but i think if our statisticians are coming to the conclusion that it's that it, as rob puts it, it's going to muck up the machinery of the entire trial or make our lives harder mm. and, uh, it, it might not be something we can actually offer um, because the the getting the answers and getting the trial to work is so critically important for health outcomes that um, we wouldn't want to mess it up. No, but I mean, I, th I think if you've got that group at the beginning that are that 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 steering group and you've got all of those people involved, I think it's a conversation that that you know I I believe that really involving people all the way through, and they don't have to un you know you can have a conversation about the statistics about it and all of the other planning. It doesn't mean that that has to trump it, but you can actually get good impact and in, in, information from people. Thanks. Rather than saying, we're, this is what we've thought of we're going to do, what do you think? Which is yeah, and to be clear, involvement said, more about just consulting people. Yeah, we've got consumer input right throughout and, and Melinda Cruz, I'm not sure if she's on the call, is on our trial steering and management committee. So certainly input into everything that we're thinking about um, doing. Yeah stages and the way and, and and more to be done no doubt yeah. and did you uh, earlier on the question you asked that sort of fits uh was about was that about explaining the type of this yeah I've, I've just forgotten what that last yeah well it's about explaining you know the conclusions of, of these adaptive platform trials and it, it's not unique to us um but it is kind of unique to our specialty um you know even reading the recovery results or the remap cap results or, or the snap results it's you know it's not not that obvious what what it's saying sometimes and and the, it's got to be really careful how we can how we can interpret how clinicians will interpret the results um, providing them with all the information they they feel that they need to make a decision and also how we explain these sorts of results really clearly to consumers. Yeah, and I think that's where that group that you've got you've got that lived experience group would be really helpful about. Um, be, should be really helpful about helping you work that out because they will also know what is it that they want to, un, you know, what are the things that they need to understand from the, that what you've got. Yeah. What have other people's been experienced about communicating it to clinicians from the trials that they've run in terms of the, the phrasing and the way of, um, I think like our challenges with the with the ordinal scale, we've got so many points in it that there'll be a shift, like if we shift away from death, um, some of the babies will lower down the scale, but have better outcomes. There'll be more having some of those outcomes that are at the lower point of the scale by moving to the top, which we understand. But just in terms of how that come, how you present that data and how it's communicated and people's confidence in that data to be able to change practice, um, I guess it's one of the challenges. I mean, we've looked at trials where, you know, it's just death as your outcome. And so it's kind of easy to say, well, less people died with this and you can explain it with the proportional odds ratio but using it with a scale have people what's people's experiences been 
Uh, Ian, you've got your hand up. Are you wanting to answer that question? Yeah, yeah, I was wanting to answer that question. I don't think I've got you know a, a definitive answer to the question. It's a complex one, but um, I guess the the key complexity here in using an ordinal scale analysed with a with a proportional odds model as you're planning is that you're making an assumption that the effect on reducing death, for example, is the same as the uh, effect on reducing, for example, admission to the neonatal unit. Uh, and in theory, it's possible that those two effects could be quite different. Um, so, so how you're going to deal with the scenario that might arise, which is that the, the, the treatments have different effects on those different dimensions will be important to think through. And just have, to add have, some complexity, yeah. again, you know, if we look at the scale on the screen there, your 36 week babies who are usually pretty well are almost never going to be anywhere above about number four. And your mm -hmm. preterm infants that are always sick are going to always be somewhere above number four. So just as an example of different populations in different domains, they're not going to be all lumped together in, in receiving the same interventions. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's the other thing, that there'll be some zeros or some less than 1% um, in some of these categories. Um, Steve, so you're, yeah, so what that will mean is that your later, if, you, if you've got a positive effect on the later term, babies in terms of keeping them out of the new neonatal unit, for example, um, your analysis will sort of imply that there's also a positive effect on uh, keeping the earlier babies alive. Um, and so if if in reality the, those two effects are not consistent, then that'll, that'll become a challenge for your proportional odds model. So if some thought say, about, yeah. If we were to say something like outcomes were improved, Full stop, and then presented each of these, uh, each of the outcomes on the scale with what actually happened to each of them. Would that go some way to to mitigating that confusion? Yeah, well, I think about this analysis as um, fourteen different logistic regression analyses, where you're you sort of two and below as your outcome, and then three and below as your outcome, four and below, and you can actually do those. For, there's 14 different logistic regression analyses you can do and look at the consistency between them. Um, and if they're giving a very consistent message that says your proportional odds model is a good one, if they're giving an inconsistent message, then it, it says that the proportional odds model is not a good one. Um, now, the, the complication is that people sort of focus in on whatever you pre-specified as the primary analysis. Um, but... Uh, so I might hand yeah. over to Steve because I know that he'll have quite a hopefully insightful response to this as well. Uh, thank you, Lisa. Look, I'll, uh, what I want to do is um, give you um, my answer to, I can't remember now whether it was Brett or Claire's uh, question, and then respond uh, to Ian's important uh, points. Um, uh, I think the clinical community that interpret and act on the results of remap cap have acted uh, appropriately um, uh, on the results that we've provided with um, implementation and translation appropriately. I don't think that's occurred with any understanding of the endpoint. Um, I've attempted to explain the endpoint at times, at least uh, as I understand it, to fairly sophisticated audiences, people who've done a lot of clinical trials, and I'm fairly sure that I've failed to explain uh, the nuances, even uh, to a group who've done a lot of trials, let alone uh, coalface uh, clinicians. Um, in response uh, to Ian's comment, the, the, the value of the ordinal scale is completely destroyed if you have divergent treatment effect and you, you're, you're, you are taking a gamble on the treatment effect being proportional and to some extent without the availability of um, uh, tests with appropriate specificity and sensitivity to understand whether or not there is a loss of proportionality of treatment effect. Um, what we are proposing to do in remap cap, notwithstanding the capacity 
that the capacity doesn't exist to test for lack of proportionality is to set up the statistical analysis committee to concentrate on the patient-centered ends of the ordinal scale if they believe that there is um, a possibility of a, uh, the absence of a proportional treatment effect. So there is a pathway to manage it if there's a concern uh, that um, treatment effect is non-proportional, particularly if it's divergent. Now, I'm just very wary of time. I think we can probably have some more discussion. But Nikki, are you online? Because I do want before some people, I realise some people will need to leave in a couple of minutes. Um, and so we do want to just let people know that the next session is on Thursday, the 9th of November at 3 p.m., um, which will go hopefully into people's calendars and information will be sent out. But Nikki, are you there? Do you want to do the online poll now and then perhaps we can keep discussion going? Or how does how do you want that to work in terms of? Sure. Oh, I um I have a hand over the notes, but I'm actually not familiar with how the polls work, to be honest, Lisa. If this is my first time doing this, so um I might in the in the sake of time, can we just leave that and I can rely on one of my colleagues to help me out tomorrow with that and we'll just keep going if that's okay with you, Lisa. Sounds great. Um thank perfect. you. Oh, so perfect. That I just wanted to make sure we covered that off before yep. the top of the hour. Um so uh Steve oh, Tom, let's go with Tom. Um, thanks, Brett and Claire. Um, look, I think um, one of the challenges I think with the ordinal outcome is is um, not just the problem with the non-proportionality, but the actual um, both um, you know reducing the risk of necro ne necrotizing enterocolitis, for example, but increasing the risk of brain. Injury, so there's not a sort of a natural sequence to it. Whereas where we've often used ordinal outcomes before, there is a natural natural sequence, like number of days free of ventilatory support or whatever. If you've got five, if you've got five days and you've had at least four, and you've, <laughs> and you've if you've got four, you've had at least three. So there's sort of a natural sequence. So whereas here. Um, they're sort of ranked in terms of badness, but there's no natural sequence um, to to them. So I think that that problem with one intervention, you know, having uh, uh, um, moving in one direction at one end of the scale and the other direction the other, I think is a real is a is a much bigger problem here than perhaps perhaps others. Um, so so worth worth thinking about that. that my um, other comment, I guess, is at a higher level, uh, just in terms of how you are conceptualizing the domains. Um, so it it seems to me that this is really a platform of platform trials. Um, uh, it's so huge that you've got actually multiple um, conditions in one you've you've got your gut related problems your lung related problems your eye related problems <laughs> um, and each one of those could be a platform uh, in itself and the sort of immediate objectives of treatment are not identical in in each of them and if you're trying to evaluate a treatment um, the way you might evaluate a treatment for um, uh, for either prevention or treatment of um, bronchopulmonary dysplasia would be very different from how you might evaluate some treatment or prevention of retinopathy of prematurity or, or, or whatever. So it is really nice to have the core outcome set and it is really nice to think about as some sort of natural ordering of the badness of those things and perhaps even try to weight the badness of those of those various outcomes. But um, uh, you might have difficulty uh, if you're using that ordinal outcome as the basis for um, evaluating a particular treatment within a um, domain or for a particular condition. Um, you might lose some sensitivity uh, there to be able to to make 
make make decisions that uh, compared to if you had actually different outcomes um, uh, for each of those different contexts of of care because I imagine unless this is all about is this all about prevent prevention or that is going to apply to every mum and to every baby or are we thinking that they're going to be some babies who have got um, evidence of intraventricular hemorrhage or who have got um, gut problems and so they're going to be eligible for a specific domain but not eligible for for another one because it seems as though they perhaps for some babies the object immediate objectives are a little bit little bit different from from other babies yeah, that's a, a very, very good point, Tom, and something we've thought a bit about. And yes, it sort of lends itself to the prevention rather than coming in at 50 days of age when you already might be halfway up the scale and trying to prevent something else above it, doesn't it? Um, certainly, of course, the pregnancy domains and interventions are all about prevention um, because they're antenatal and anything that happens in early life similarly. But uh, yes, it does it does create a problem for, for example, if you want to randomise it. A 23 week or when they're two months old um, and some of these things have already happened to them yeah food for thought we're working though that we did have some i mean it's a platform for platforms i totally agree with you like this the domains are a could be an apt in their own a platform trial in their own right um but we're working that we had something that sort of flowed through for most babies that journey from fetus to the baby um and we completely recognize that it doesn't fit for all like trials and it, it doesn't fit for me, like everything and we encourage people to continue to do it but it was just a way of kind of bringing the infrastructure together and um enabling us to do more trials where we're following through that journey and we're looking at things across that time frame so it's not going to be fit for purpose for everything but what we didn't want was to end up with lots and lots of platform trials so we have colleagues um not in australia and new zealand but overseas you know are planning a, a neck trial for example or a feeding trial um as an isolated platform trial and then another group is planning on a, a one about a particular drug. And it, our concern is it just is going to be very confusing for hospitals and um, and individual sites to be recruiting for multiple platform trials. So if we can encompass it in one and have at least a subset of domains that are appropriate for a group of patients that run through it, that we'll, we think that's probably the right way to go um, and recognising that there'll be other things running in parallel. Steve? Yeah, look, uh, thanks, uh, Lisa. Um, I want to en endorse what Tom said uh, in the first part of his um, uh, comment, um, but um, uh, I put a, a contrary view in relation to the um, uh, second uh, side of what he talked about. If I look at the slides that's on, on the screen at the moment, that feels very process mechanism uh, oriented uh, to me. Um, Whereas ultimately each individual mother and neonate has one outcome that relates to um, uh, their, their constellation or aggregated patient-centered uh, outcome uh, from multiple uh, potential processes. You can only die once, doesn't necessarily matter what you die from, you can only be disabled once doesn't necessarily matter what drives uh, the disability. So, so I, as I've, I've mentioned to you, I think in other uh, forums, I've got concerns about that ordinal scale, whereas I wouldn't share, have those concerns where what you're measuring is something related to the universality of the uh, final outcome uh, aggregated across all of the different processes um, uh, that, uh, that were present. Um, in respect to, um, um, uh, you know, whether you can slice and dice this um, by platforms for the respiratory component or the eye component or the gut component, again, I just want to emphasise that um, um, each individual um, uh, patient um, can have uh, one or more of those processes, but because their final outcome occurs once and only once, I actually think it is possible to aggregate all of the questions that you might be interested in, um, uh, or at least as many of them that you might be interested in across different causal pathways and mechanisms 
uh, within a single platform. So long as you're only measuring um, some valid universal measure of outcome. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the best outcome for this trial would be neurodevelopment at two or three years. One outcome, full stop. But uh, we, we don't have to explain why that's so challenging and impossible to adapt on. Yeah. No, but um, there might well be uh, things that you can measure um, early in the course um, that um, uh, uh, have strong predictive value of, uh, well, you know, um, if, you, if you're dead early, you're not going to be alive for two years. Uh, amongst those who are um, alive uh, at a certain point, um, if you've got variables that can be used that uh, predict um, 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 a totality of disability uh, at, at two years, I don't know if such things exist, um, uh, that's, uh, that's valuable. And within the model, you can still update the patients you enrolled two years ago with their real outcome once they get to it. That's right. And, and it's worth mentioning that that um, perhaps in sort of response to both you and Tom, from, from outcome number five upwards, these are ranked in order of their predictive ability for or prediction for longer term outcomes. So they are in order of things that we know from previous research predict uh, bad outcomes. Of course, with death at the top, you can't be disabled if you're not alive. Uh, I saw Liz Baker's face flash up on the screen, and that's what I'm sure she was going to say. She's done heaps of work about this. So they are in order for an extremely preterm baby. You're more likely to have disability if you've got number 11 versus number 10 or number 9. I'm very aware that we're over time. Um, so I would just like to thank everyone who has attended, and please do drop off if you need to leave. But um, I know, Tom, you're welcome to make a comment while um, if Brett and Claire are happy to stay online. I think they're probably yeah. very grateful for any feedback. So um, yeah, we're grateful. So we're happy to stay if others are able to, but recognize it's a lot. Thanks. Um, yeah, just following up on the ordinal scale. So I'm assuming here that um, if you have major surgery, basically that trumps if you've got retinopathy of prematurity. So if you have any major surgery, you get an outcome of 11, um, which means that having major surgery alone is ranked just as bad as having both major surgery and retinopathy and late onset sepsis and necrotizing enterocolitis. So a lot of babies will actually have multiple of these outcomes and they don't they don't add they they as soon as you've got one it trumps whatever has gone before it which i think is is also a little bit um difficult because presumably in terms of prognosis having having multiple of these outcomes is worse than just having one just having one of these, not these necessarily outcomes. so uh, liz did you want to answer that otherwise i will yeah, I'm happy to jump in, Brett. Thank you. Um, certainly having uh, accumulating morbidities is worse for your neurodevelopmental outcome, but that's not the case for all of those morbidities. Um, and that's what we've tried to reflect in those sort of 13, 14 and 15 or well, 13 and 14 outcomes that having two of those is worse than having one of those or having all of those top three is worse than having just one or two, but it doesn't necessarily apply for all of those outcomes. So it doesn't apply for retinopathy of prematurity or for sepsis. Um, it, it really is just those um, brain, lung and surgery outcomes that are cumulative. But all the things below them contribute to you having one of those things. So yeah, mm -hmm. it, it is very complex. So you're more likely to have brain injury if the things below have happened. You're more likely to have severe respiratory morbidity if the things below have happened. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm very wary of time, but I'm sure um, people can um, get in contact with Brett and Claire, or um, if you know you have any more comments, but I'd very much like to um, thank everyone, particularly our panellists um, for their time today. And thank you, Brett and Claire. That was um, a fantastic presentation. And um, just to remind everyone that the next session will be on Thursday, the 9th of November at 3 p.m. Is there anything I've missed, Nikki? 
No, thank you, Lisa. You've done an awesome job. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Congratulations, Brett and Claire. We look forward to seeing the trial start. Thanks so much for having us. Appreciate all the uh, all the advice. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks all. Thanks everyone. Thanks.